Buenos días. Vamos a empezar la segunda jornada del de primer Congreso Internacional de Igra España, el Congreso Fundacional. Eh, la vamos a inaugurar con bueno, la segunda jornada, vamos a empezar con uh, la segunda keynote que tenemos de, en Digra España. En este caso con el uh, profesor Nelson Zagalo, uh, que por motivos de, de COVID pues no, no, ha podido, no ha podido venir. Entonces, eh, lo que haremos será proceder a, no me asimilar a como tuvimos ahí la sesión con, con Clara Fernández Vara. Eh, ahora hablaremos con él y pondremos la su keynote y después de la, de la keynote pues tendremos una ronda de, de preguntas. ¿De acuerdo? Uh, hi Nelson, are you there? Hi, yes, I'm here. <laughs> hi, morning, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for your um, your keynote uh, today in uh, in the Digra uh, conference. Uh, we are very honored that uh, you could um, be here, but not, not presently, but, but in, uh, through Zoom. So thank you very much for the, the effort. We know that it's not easy to yeah. do this in, 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 in the virtual, um, in the virtual uh, system, but uh, thank you very much. I think that it will be a great keynote, and we are really interested to, to listen to, to you. Thank you for inviting me, too. <laughs> okay, so um, I will, I will um, summarize your, your profile, okay? Uh, so, el profesor Z ah, Zagalo es, es associate professor en la Universidad de, de, de Aveiro. Mm -hmm. eh, es el creador del programa de máster en Interactive Media. Es el creador también del laboratorio científico Engage Lab. Y es el fundador y fundó, vamos, la Portuguese Society for Video Game Sciences. Es editor del blog uh, Virtual Illusion y ha publicado libros como Interactive Emotions from Film to Video Games, Video Games in Portugal, History, Technology and Art y Creativity in the Digital Age. Uh, su principal foco de investigación se centra en el diseño de eh, las experiencias efectivas interactivas y trabaja sobre todo en, la, en el nivel eh, multidisciplinar de lo multimedia, narrativa y psicología. Uh, así que bueno, os, dejo, os dejamos con la, con la keynote. Uh, and Nelson, we'll, we'll see you in half an hour for yeah. the question and answer session. I'll be here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good morning. I'm Nelson Zagallo and I'm coming from the University of Aveiro and I'm doing my research at the at the, DigiMed, at the Digital Media and Interaction Research Center that is uh, situated at the University of Aveiro. Uh, I want to first say a, a great thank you for the invitation to be here, to be uh, giving you a keynote on this first uh, event of Tigre España and uh, for this first keynote I chose the, the topic on game difficulty adjustments and I will be looking at them as engagement systems. So my discussion will be related to how these game difficulty adjustments can serve players and designers in terms of the engagement uh, of the players. Uh, a just a uh, very brief uh, overview of my work. I've been a researcher on interaction design for the past 20 years. I've been designing and researching interaction in many dimensions, in many different approaches with uh, not only with games, but mainly within, within games. Uh, my main focus is how to push for playfulness, creativity and storytelling in the interaction and I work with these three dimensions, the affective, the cognitive and the embodied uh, situations. And uh, um, I have uh, published three, three, three books uh, out through them. I have many others edited with other colleagues. Uh, one is on the interactive emotions uh, related with how do we connect emotions of film with emotions uh, of playing games. Uh, the other one is related to the history of video games in Portugal. And the third one is this one from the last year and is related with engagement design. And this is what <clears throat> I'll be talking today here with you, okay? So to start, let's just give a, a, a brief look at this uh, screenshot from Wolfstein. 
uh, you can see that we have here five different uh, selectors in, in terms of, of the difficulty uh, that you can choose uh, to play this game. And uh, you can see that uh, being a, a screenshot, uh, an interface of, of the difficulty selector, you can see that the, the labels they use are not the use the ones that we are used to okay the very very easy easy normal uh, hard or super hard but you can see that they make some kind of jokes about about these these difficulty settings and they put in the first one they they even give you a a, a mug shot where you can see the player and the character uh, sucking a pacifier okay and so uh, if you look here below, you will see that you have the spineless gamer um, being uh, being uh, seen as someone that really can't do uh, a true play of this game. Okay, and this is relevant why? Because if we advance and we look at this screenshot from the the interface of select difficulty in God of War, you will see a very different scenario. Okay, you can see above in that you have four different types. Give me a story, give me a balanced experience, give me a challenge, and give me God of War. So if you look more in detail and give me a story, they will say that this is the one uh, prepared for players who want to experience the story without too much of a gameplay challenge. And then in give me God of War, they say that this is related with the... The, the requiring of very hard uh, core reflexes and strategy. So we have here some question that arise when you see these two different types or approaches to, to the difficulty selector that is related to, do we, are we really uh, selecting the difficulty of playing a game when we are using these selectors or are we adjusting the experience of gameplay, the experience of the game? Uh, and so adjusting the experience per player and not adjusting some kind of abstract, abstract difficulty, some kind of thing that someone can find very easy and the other one can find very hard. So the, the interest of my talk here is really to discuss this to discuss this possibility and to discuss it we need to first look at the experience okay we need to start understanding what is an experience how can we understand the experience of you of the users of the players <clears throat> and how can it be measured and how can we uh, work on it okay so in to have to start with an example i, I normally use this this episode from from proust uh, that is called the the proust madeleine and we can see in these two texts that I have extracted from the research of, of the, the last time that we have here uh, an event or a situation where Proust is uh, eating a, a cake with some tea and then he feels something very strong, okay? Feel a sensation very strong and he, and he starts a process of trying to understand what happened to him, okay? And so he says that, and suddenly the memory revealed itself, okay? Is it, what is he talking? He's talking for uh, about the memory that is being recalled by the experience. So you can see that we have the Madeleine cake and the tea but you can see in the second picture that the, the eating of the cake and the sipping of the tea are really re making him remember of his infancy, of when he was with his grandparents, when he was in vacations out of Paris, when he, when he, were, when he was having all these experiences that he loved so much, okay? So we could say that this, uh, this specific experience felt sort of... Um, recovering emotions and giving them a meaning and so feeling something very intense in that moment this is something that of course is very subjective okay uh, and this is something that also results from the combination of the artifact in this case is a cake it can be a book it can be a movie it can be a game 
and we can see that what is happening is, is a process of communication where the meaning of this uh, artifact is really giving a body uh, to the experience. The experience is gaining a momentum inside uh, our own minds and we are attributing it a meaning and attributing it as the sensation of feeling something that we give some kind of value, okay? And so, these are the things that we are trying to produce when we are creating art, when we are creating any kind of artifact. It can be dance, it can be music, it can be movies, it can be games, it can be whatever we humans create and share with other humans, okay? So the, the, the situation here is that this very specific thing that we call experience is nothing more than an episode or a bit of time, a chunk of time, as Asun Sal says, that as that puts together sights and sounds, feelings and thoughts, and really uh, receive a label that we can uh, relieve and that we can share with other people, that we can uh, relieve anytime we want in our own minds, and that represents a kind of chunk of our own lives, okay? And so that's why this is very important to us. How this is built? Well, this is built through three uh, vectors, okay? The artifact, of course, is pushing the, the, the creation of, of this experience and the context uh, is creating the meaning together with the artifact. But all these three are coming together inside the mind of the person, okay? So, this is a subjective a subjective thing, okay? Talking about experience is not something that we are designing the experience. We can design the artifact, we can push a little bit for the context, and we can select a person, but we cannot design for this specific person because we are not a person. We are just designing the artifact. So uh, what we need to understand is how can we affect the imagination, the, the experience that the person is feeling when he makes in, when he puts in contact the artifact that someone has created with his own history, with his own mind, with his own memories of, of the, the lived experience of the past, okay? So here we, we need to talk about engagement because engagement is where when these things may get in contact, okay? So interactive artifacts are very good for that because they, they, they promote the agency, they, they build uh, communication through cycles, and they uh, prepare uh, the path for our experiences, okay? The communication for real is, of course, is happening through the representations in the artifact, but most of it also happens through the interaction process. And that's the thing that we are uh, worried here or concerned about here today, uh, because this is uh, a process of video games, and video games use the interaction to really promote the agency and, and then the feeling of the game and the world of the game, okay? So how, how can we look at this? Uh, interaction design is normally defined as something that really requires these three variables, okay? The, you do something and then you feel something and then you interpret or note something, okay? And this happens while you are interacting with an artifact or when you are interacting with a so-called outside experience, okay? And in the middle, we have the engagement. What am I talking when I'm talking here about engagement? When I'm saying that to produce interaction, we need to engage players. What I'm talking is that we need to find the ways that will promote or that will put people in, in, a, in a, a moment or, or a, a want that they really want to interact, they really want to touch, they really want to put to move, they really want to make something, okay? And to do that, we need to understand what is in, what 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 really motivates people, okay? So how do we move these players? How, how can we put them in motion in order for them to start engaging, engaging with our artifact and so create the experiences? Uh, for that, you, uh, I'm presenting here the, the self-determination theory created by Desi and Ryan. And they gave us three uh, big 
vectors of, of motivation, the autonomy, the competence, and the relatedness, okay? And so in terms of the autonomy, uh, we have uh, a motivation to interact that is related with freedom, okay? Uh, we need freedom in order to uh, maintain our want or our will to interact. We need to feel that we are uh, aware, that we are able to choose our own path, that we are able to do whatever we want in the moment that we want, okay? Of course, games offer this with some limitations, with rules, as you know. But but one of the things that games uh, allow much, most is really this autonomy, this sense of freedom, this sense that we can do, that it's up to you, to us to decide in each moment what can we do, what should we do, and how can we do it, okay? And so the more the games work around this, this uh, object of autonomy, the more motivated the, the, the players will be. In the second, we have the competence, okay? The mastery. The competence is always something that is progressing, it's something that we want to master, that we want to gain the domain, to understand it for real, and to understand how can we really uh, push uh, in one way uh, and get better and better and better at doing it, okay? And so this is something that motivates us a lot because we see that we are progressing, that we are advancing, and so we, we maintain, we push for the mastery because we are we are advancing, and then the problem here happens when we are pushing more and more and more, and we and we don't advance. If, if when things like that if happens in video games, most of us know that we will stop. We will not continue playing because we understand that the game is not for us. That we don't understand what the game needs. Uh, okay, so the motivation stops there, and the engagement stops. So the the game is not able to engage people. Okay. And the third uh, one is the relatedness. And this one is related with the social domain, okay? Uh, in this uh, place, games play in two different uh, spheres, okay? We have the sphere of the sharing our experiences playing video games and that people like uh, to, to play with us and we, we like to talk about games with others that we like to, uh, or social games where we can be with each other. But we also have the games that use storytelling, that use stories, that within these stories use characters. And, though, and so we start identifying identify with these characters, we start relating with these characters, and we start creating a relation. And this puts us in, in, in a situation that we want to know more and more about these characters, about their problems, about their conflicts, and, and sort of like we want to help them, we want to be part of their world, okay? And this motivates us to continue in the in the game, okay? So, looking at, at these two uh, perspectives, where you see where you have the interaction that is is done through uh, interpreting things, doing things, and feeling these things, we can connect them to the motivations, and we can see that when we when we are trying to know something, when we are trying to interpret something, we are really trying to be competent. We are really trying to mastering and advancing and progressing in something. On the other side, when we are doing things, when we are in this um, mindset that we want to create, build, construct things, we are really looking at doing, but we need autonomy for that, okay? And so we can call this the expression, as I, I forget to say that the first one is the progression, okay? You feel the progress to the competence. Here you feel the expression from, from your autonomy. You can construct, you can build, okay? Build. And in the last one, the feeling, the, 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 the feeling, the sensations, what is happening and, and, and feeling the situation, we uh, can connect it with the relatedness, okay? The relatedness of, of the people, the real persons. How, how do they move themselves? How do they feel it? And so we want to feel with them. And so we call this uh, the vector or, or the stream of engagement uh, rela uh, uh, relation, okay? So I would say that, and this is uh, what I've done in my, my book on engagement design, that we have three big streams of engagement, okay? We can design for the progression, we can design for the expression, or we can design for the relation, okay? And if we go, if we advance and, and start uh, looking at these uh, vectors, these streams, and start applying them to games, 
what do we have? Okay, let's look, for example, at progression. We have the known, the, we want to know more, we want to be more competent. And so I'll, I'll do the games, uh, I'll do the designing games push for that. In terms of elements, we have all these these things that we are now using in gamification in trying to gamify, gamify uh, experience in real world, like points, badges, and leaderboards, okay? Where you have all these points that keep advancing, 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 and then we have more and more badges, and we want more and more. And so this is like metric rewards, okay? We want to be rewarded by doing something, by really pushing for it. And so all these uh, elements of game design, like the punishments, like, like the win and lose conditions, all that, they really work to build a, an envelope, a world where we can uh, um, understand that if we do that correct, we will progress, we, we will advance, we will know more, okay? And so the kind of verbs that we use in terms of designing the world here is really problem solving. Problem solving is the is the real beast here. Okay, you need to build puzzles, enigmas, all these kinds of situations where you have to find a solution. Because in these kinds of, of stream of engagement, people really want to compete and to surpass, gain, win, all these things. Okay. But if you now look at the, at the expression one. Uh, the autonomy, the, the, the constructing, doing, all the elements that we will see are, are a bit different. We have many tools, we have these open walls, we have these craft molds, we, we can, we have many uh, different tools to build new walls. As you can see, you have Minecraft here and you can build all these walls, but you can also build new maps for Doom or for any other games, okay? So in these kinds of, of games, the approach is really to uh, the use of verbs in terms of creation, invention, exploration, uh, discover, uh, and mainly improvise, okay? We request people to be creative. We request people to challenge themselves and go beyond their, the, the, the known world, okay? And then in the last one, we have the relation and the feel, okay? And then so here we have the relatedness. And in terms of building this relatedness inside the, the game, of course, we need stories, okay? We need the characters, we need the dialogues, we need the conflicts, and uh, above all, we need to have, sh we need changes according to these characters, okay? We cannot only have characters there. Something needs to happen to them, and we need to uh, start understanding what is happening to them. And so the verbs here come from the empathizing, the sympathizing, cooperation, sharing. So this is the point where we start relating with others and we start feeling what the others feel, okay? And so we start understanding the world, but we also understand ourselves inside our own minds, okay? Storytelling is really uh, relevant because of that, because it works like a mirror. It works like something that helps me understand why I do something in one situation and I do another thing in another situation, okay? So, um, of course, all this is very interesting, but I, I was, as I was saying in the beginning, all this is, is very subjective, okay? We can design for these three motivation systems, these three streams of engagement. But of course, the, the past experience, the memory depend and are different from people to people, from player to player, okay? But not everything is so subjective because if we look at players, we will find, find, find that players have preferences and one of the big studies that he has done for the past uh, 10 years uh, that they, that he has been building this this database on on game on gamer motivation and gamer preferences we can see that we have some patterns that there are some patterns for real behind the preferences of the players so if we look more in detail what we will see is that we can at least look at three big types of players, okay? We'll have the players that love the mastery and the achievement, okay? They look for challenges, strategy. What they want is really to complete the thing, to, to feel the power of, of achieving everything, okay? And so these players... They really want to know. They, they, they really work to know more and more and more and get access to more. And so th this, this 
players, these guys are, are mostly uh, structuring and abstracting the world around them. Okay? They look at things and then try to understand the mechanics and then try to understand how to push it for or how to extract the most of it. Okay? So we call them the abstractionists because they really don't relate very well with very concrete things, with very human things. Okay? So, in the second uh, area, we can talk about the tinkerers. These kinds of players, they are really into the thing of the creativity. They, they really want to design, to discover. They, they look for the excitement of the new, of understanding how things are built inside. That's why they destruct. They destruct to understand the inside, okay? So they seek the novel. They, they really look to uh, go in depth in trying to how are things working on and then how can I build from them, okay? And in the third level, we have these uh, dramatists, okay? The dramatists, they are in the social and in the immersion, okay? They, they compete in terms of social. They want to be like the others. They want to feel like the others. But in the end, what they are looking is for a good story. What they are looking is for a way to understand their own lives, okay? So they want to feel. Uh, and so we call them the dramatists. Uh, let's now have a look at, at, at some personas on that, okay? We have, I have used three uh, big names of the Renaissance uh, in order to have some figures that all of us know. And if you, if you for, for example, really look at Descartes and his work, you will see that Descartes and, uh, and uh, Descartes was an abstractionist, okay? He would say, I think, therefore I am, okay? He would abstract the world. He would try to understand the world not in his in his tiny little pieces, not in his subjective things, but he would try to build a model that, that, that a model that would allow him to understand the entire world, that would allow him to understand the reality, okay? He was a mathematician, of course. Uh, if we go for the thinkers, there's no better person than talking about Leonardo da Vinci. You have someone that that has read that has written more than thirty thousand pages, but that's not published one book. Okay, why? Because his his urgency was of doing, of creating. He was not really worried about anything else. Okay, he wanted to experiment, to to try for new things, to try for different things all the time, all the time, all the time. Okay, and so he never finished the things he started. And and we have in turn and now for the dramatists, of course, we can look at Shakespeare. Okay, one of the biggest storytellers of of uh, our world and of our history, of course. And, and we know that what made him happy was really the social uh, relation with other people and how he could uh, play with these social sentiments, with this empathizing, with this sympathizing, and then tell stories through them, okay? So, if, you, if we bring back the, the, the definition that we have had for the, for the players, we could see that uh, people in the abstractionist uh, profile would prefer to engage with progression design. On the other side, uh, thinkers uh, would prefer with, to, uh, to engage with expression design. And so dramatists would, of course, prefer to engage uh, with, with a, a design that creates relations, okay? So, in the end, our answer to, to the question that we launched in the beginning about uh, the difficulty selector is that in the end, the, the difficulty selector is not for real adjusting any difficulty. What is it doing is, is really adjusting the player's type of engagement. Uh, we know that we are different from all others. Uh, of course, we have many patterns in common with all our friends. But we know that we like to play some games and that other people don't like to play. I, for myself, I love to play narrative games. I don't like too much to play competitive games. I don't like too much to play creative games. I, I like to look at, at Minecraft, but I never play it because I, don't, I feel I don't extract uh, enough gratification from it. 
And the same goes with with uh, games like like chess, like puzzles, enigmas, and all that. My feeling is always related. Well, what I what, what am I extracting from this? Okay, okay, I'm progressing, but I'm progressing in terms of an abstraction. Okay, I don't care about an abstraction. I care about an history. Okay, uh, a story. And so the question here, when you look at God of War and he says, "Give me a story or give me a challenge," what we are talking is not really. The game is more difficult or less difficult for these all these ty- these different types of persons. Okay, no, what we are doing when we are creating these adjusting adjusting selectors is that we are uh, creating the opportunity for a, a bigger demographics to play the game. Okay, you can have people playing God of War. They really love a, a good story, and we have a very good story in God of War. But we can also have people that love competition that love to progress and feel all the harshness of all this to feel all the all the all the impact and all the sensation of being uh, not easy to collect all the things okay and so these kinds of of people really go for the challenge and, and don't care about story if they can they'll push the button and, and jump the narrative because he doesn't talk to them okay so the question here is not really about having a, a selector that say you can go and it's easier for you or you are you are just a, a little boy and you can't really uh, go for the art part but is really um, designing this the artifact the video game in a manner when we can give the players the possibility to adjust the games to their own uh, interests and their own profiles of of gameplay okay and this is this is why this is so important that's why a lot, a lot of people are researching now this in terms of understanding even even if you can go forward uh, in terms of, of the difficulty selector and if we can uh, instead of having only this difficulty selector uh, giving him them giving these difficulties so some kind of AI, and the AI will adjust the game throughout the gameplay to the type of, of uh, player that we have. And so this, this is my presentation. Uh, I have here some references that you can look at. Uh, it's my book, and we have the refs on Ye work, the Asenzal work on experience, the, 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 the reference on, on the self-determination theory, and then and, and so uh, the Dewey and then the Proust, okay? And uh, I finish here my, my presentation. I'm now open to questions and uh, I will be with you online. So hope it's enough for now and let's talk after the, the end of this video. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Nelson, do you hear us? Yes. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you for your so well structured and so well presented uh, keynote, very interesting. Also with yes, um, this uh, unexpected experience of having in the same slide, you know, God of War and Descartes, uh, Da Vinci and, <laughs> and Shakespeare, <laughs> it was a little bit mind blowing in the sense. Um, well, in any case, uh, now I will we'll open the, the, the opportunity to the public to have uh, Questions for our keynote presenter for Nelson Sagalo? Okay, so uh, let's start with a question. Well, thank you very much, Nelson. Uh, this is Jorge Ceja talking here. I was there in the Engage Lab three, four years ago. I remember ago, you. So it's great to close the circle and seeing you here. We are very happy to, to have you here. Um, I think thank that you. it's great, the analysis that you have done of the self-determination theory applied to games because uh, Historically, it has been used uh, in many, many fields and not that much in games. So I think that this is super interesting. And it reminds me that uh, I don't know the story very well, but at a certain point, um, Daisy and Ryan with some other folks, I think that they tried to build kind of a consultant company. I think that it was uh, immersive.com or something like that, that Uh they tried to use all these indicators uh, regarding mastery and relatedness. to help the companies to um, 
let them know if a game was going to work or not in, mm -hmm. the, in the market. Um, mm -hmm. And I think my idea is that it didn't work very well because uh, yeah. if we understand games as an art form, um, it's mm -hmm. not that easy to make these equations of, okay, I'm going to put this, you are going to get to this level or feeling of mastery, and then the game is going to be uh, s sold very well. Um, my question is, um, how do you think that these kind of simple equations would work? Maybe not for selling the game, but as you are saying, for at least targeting particular um, kind of players. So do you think that uh, if we introduce these particular elements in a very intentional way, we may achieve that these particular kind of players would like the game? Or um, if we approach two games as an art form, there's no way of, uh, of uh, doing this kind of uh, strict equations. I don't know if yeah. it's kind of clear my... Yeah, I understood, I understood, yeah. This is a this is a question that that arises all the time that we are discussing this type of designs using the the self determination theory or using any other model for design. Uh, most of my work since the beginning, when I was working with emotion, have been uh, have been uh, arising questions like 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 this one that you are putting here. People start looking at the models that I'm designing and say, "Well, so you are saying that using these." I will be able to achieve this uh, specific uh, experience, this specific kind of emotions in this kind of multi motivations, and then we can we can uh, stimulate that in people. The problem is is what you are saying. The problem is that games are an artistic object. Being an artistic object, they are a subjective artifact. You can we cannot. Of course, we develop design models. And design models help us in the process of designing and creating our games. But mm, there are no formulas to create a successful game. There are no, no formulas to create a successful film. There are no formulas to create a successful book. They are all dependent on many variables that we cannot control. Uh, of course, one of the, the big variables is the author and his subjectivity and the way he chooses to present things. But there are other, other, other variables that we cannot control. We cannot control the, the, the subjects, the, the, the people that will play the game. And they are, they are very variable. But if we use these designs, what we can achieve is that we can at least uh, work uh, in the problems of, of the designing of the interaction, work being conscious that we are trying to achieve these kinds of players, these other kinds of players. And now, at the moment, we are already doing that, okay? When you are building a game, you already know that your game will be an action-adventure game, will be a platformer, will be a, a, an open-world game, will be a, a, an experimental game. So we already use the genres to, to, to help us in, in, in approaching the, the creation of our products. What we are doing is to create uh, more low-level uh, models to help designers. And also this model, and I had a, a master student working with this model, uh, he, he tried also to, to use it in order to help the, the indie games industry uh, to achieve a more larger audience, okay? So one of the problems is that when you are building an indie game, we don't have much money, we don't have much, much people to test it. And we also normally want to be uh, the author. We have a, a personal view of the world. So the question for this model is not to really tweak or change this vision of the world, is to help the designer in um, adding some elements that can attract more different kinds of players. And with that, enlarge the, 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 the audience that will buy his game, okay? So I see it uh, in, from this perspective. Of course, there are other situations when you are talking about, for example, games for change, and you want, and you want a serious game that act upon behavioral changes on persons, okay? And so you can use also this design model to help in these situations. But as you are saying, George, there are no formulas. This does not serve to say, well, if you use, use this model, 
you will make it okay no 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 way okay uh, and that's why i also chose to present this as as a, a, a selector of experience because you see when you are designing games and represent this level these these difficulty selectors uh, what people are really trying to achieve is really to enlarge the audience that will play the game so what we are trying to analyze here is analyzing okay when you lower the level of combat the level of of uh, number of ai npcs on on the field the number of the the the, the amount of time you will spend uh, fighting people uh, to advance uh, you are really uh, changing uh, the experience and, and i was even in the other day i was talking with some colleagues sometimes i play the same game as my colleagues but because normally i play it in the so-called very easy i have the sensation that i've played a different game from my colleagues okay so but the, the question is that the experience serves my purpose doesn't serve the purpose of my colleagues i have colleagues that only play in hard mode they hate uh, normal and easy they, they don't see that as a game okay but i i will shut myself here because otherwise we can could keep talking about this for hours <laughs> thank you for your answer uh, more questions No? Not any other questions? <laughs> it was so super, super clear. <laughs> Presentation? <laughs> no? OK. So Nelson, uh, thank you very much for your, your keynote again. Uh, thank you very much uh -huh. for your participation in this, in this Congress. And uh, well, we hope that in, in future uh, Congresses, we can meet uh, in presence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and physically. for sure. OK, thank you okay, very much. Thank you. Thank you.